Alrighty, quick walkthrough of the homework. So we'll go through 5B1, then 5B2, then 5B3, and go from there. So uh, you can mute me and just write down answers, but uh, you'll miss my witty conversation and hopefully some knowledge thrown your way. So let's see. <clears throat> Change in temperature affecting air's density. So warm air expands. When it expands, that means the molecules are further apart, and that means there's going to be less pressure because there's fewer molecules between your head and where space is. So temperature goes up, density goes down. One goes up, other goes down. They're doing opposites. That's an inverse relationship. What produces atmospheric pressure? Well, if you lay it on the ground and uh, you put a brick on your chest and then another brick and then another brick, you'd be feeling brick pressure because you'd be stacking more and more bricks on you. I don't recommend doing that, but that's what you'd have. Now, atmospheric pressure, <clears throat> we're not stacking bricks on you, we're stacking air on you. And so it's the weight of the air from where you are to space pushing down on you that causes atmospheric pressure. We think of air as weightless, but that's just wrong. Air does have weight and its weight is what pre creates the pressure. 14.7 pounds per square inch of pressure just due to the weight of the air. How would an increase in air temperature affect atmospheric pressure? Well, like we just said uh, for the first one, when temperature goes up, the air gets less dense. Less dense air is lighter, fewer molecules between you and space, so that's going to cause the air pressure to decrease. So when temperature goes up, air pressure goes down, because the air expands and becomes less dense. The molecules are further apart. And the relationship between altitude and atmospheric pressure. Well, the higher you go, the lower the pressure is. Because, again, I'm, I'm repeating this a lot, when you're higher, there's less air between you and space. That means there's less pressure pushing on you from the weight of the air. So... Altitude increases, pressure decreases, inverse relationship. What is standard atmospheric pressure? This is in the reference tables on page 13. 1,013.2 millibars. It's also 29.92 inches. Not a number you have to memorize because it is on page 13, but I'll be honest, it's a tiny little spot and you'll never find it uh, unless you remember it's there. It's just as easy to remember 1,013.2 millibars. What's the relationship between temperature and moisture in the atmosphere? Well, temperature increases, the amount of water vapor the air can hold. This is the important part, it can hold increases. <clears throat> it doesn't mean it has more moisture in it, it just means it could possibly, because there's more energy present to keep the water evaporated, and so it has that ability. What is true of air that's saturated? Well, saturated, the word saturated means full. So it doesn't matter the, the term, really. You could have a saturated paper towel that's full of water. You could sit in class for an hour and a half and your brain becomes full, saturated, can't handle any more information. So it's the maximum amount of water vapor the air can hold at a current temperature. Now, relative humidity. <clears throat> humidity in general is, how, is water in the air. Relative humidity specifically is the ratio of the amount of water in the air compared to the maximum amount it could hold. It's not telling you how many gallons of water are there, or liters, if you want to use the metric system. It's telling you the percentage of fullness. So percentage of fullness, sort of like the gas gauge on a four-wheeler, jet ski, boat, car. They don't necessarily tell you how many gallons are in the tank. They tell you the percentage of fullness, like, hey, it's half full, it's 100% full, it's empty, uh-oh. So air, uh, air works the same way with relative humidity. Relative humidity of saturated air, well, if it's full, it's at capacity, it's 100%. What's the relationship between the temperature of air and the relative humidity if all other variables remain constant? Okay, so temperature of air and relative humidity if we don't change anything else, that's what the last part means. Well, if you have a certain amount of water in the air and then the air warms up, it's not going to be as full as it was because when you warm the air up, it has a greater capacity. It can hold more. 
So when temperature increases, the humidity, relative humidity, relative fullness decreases because it's now able to hold more, but you didn't add more because it said all other variables remain constant. And that's an inverse relationship. Temperature go uppy uppy, humidity go downy downy. What temperature is relative humidity 100%? That would be the dew point temperature. By definition, the dew point temperature is the temperature that the air becomes saturated at. In your room right now, where you are, there is a temperature where you could cool that air down to that temperature and it would become saturated. Condensation would start to form on the walls uh, because the, the air could not hold any more moisture. Number four, what two variables are included when giving wind velocity? Any type of velocity really is speed and direction. It's a vector quantity. So you need how fast and what direction. And wind direction indicates the direction from which the wind is blowing. North winds come from the north and blow to the south. Uh, west winds blow from the west to the east. So the direction they're coming from, that's how we name them. North winds tend to bring cold air for us here in northern New York. Okay, that's 5B1. Onward to 5B2, where we're talking about atmospheric moisture now. Now, this is the weather unit, so really that's the only moisture we care about is atmospheric moisture. What's the most important process by which moisture enters the Earth's atmosphere? Well, most of the Earth's surface is covered by water, so evaporation from that surface, mainly the ocean, is where we get water into our atmosphere. It does evaporate from you and I, it evaporates from puddles, it evaporates from lakes and streams and ponds, it evaporates all over the place. Where is it most significant? Big bodies of water, namely the oceans. We live next to the Great Lakes, so they would count too. What process transfers moisture to the atmosphere more rapidly than evaporation? Well, the other one in our notes is transpiration. When plants expend energy, pull water up from their roots, use it for photosynthesis, and then the waste product water gets pushed out through their leaves, that is faster. However, plants don't cover most of the Earth's surface. But where you do have a lot of them, like rainforest, for instance, you can end up with a whole bunch of water being pumped into the air very rapidly. All right, number two. Do evaporation and transpiration give off energy or absorb it? Well, they absorb energy. In order to evaporate water, it has to have energy added to it. If you get wet in a rainstorm and then the wind blows across you and the water evaporates off you, you feel cold because your heat energy is being used to evaporate the water. And it's not a very pleasant experience. So they absorb energy. Do these two processes add energy or remove energy from the atmosphere? They add it. If that water that was just on your skin, when it evaporated, it took your energy into the atmosphere with it and it blew away. So they add energy to the atmosphere. Why is the atmosphere not warmed up by evaporation and transpiration? When is it warmed up? What's going down? Well, it's warmed up. Uh, it doesn't warm up the atmosphere right away because it's stored up in a phase change. Phase changes are potential energy. We talked about this earlier in the year. When a phase change goes on, the temperature doesn't change, but energy is moving. It's potential energy. So the heat energy is stored as potential energy. That's why no warming goes on. The atmosphere is warmed up for the second part of the question when it condenses. So if you have liquid water turn into water vapor, takes energy into the atmosphere, when that water vapor turns back into droplets again, or possibly ice crystals if it's sublimation, that's going to release the energy that was stored in it, and that's going to have a warming effect on the atmosphere. <clears throat> when it rains or when it snows, it actually warms up the air a little bit. Indicate what each of the following factors increases or decreases the rate of evaporation. Well, if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the rate of evaporation. Hot water evaporates faster. Wind speed, more wind, more gooder, it is going to increase the rate of evaporation. 
Hence, like a blow dryer for hair or a hand dryer in the restroom, they blow hot air across your hands or hair as the case may be, and they both increase the rate the water dries up at. Increasing the surface area. When you take water and spread it out into a thin layer, there's more molecules at the surface to be exposed to the air, so there's more evaporation happening at any point increases. And the moisture content of the atmosphere. If the air is already wet, it's not as thirsty for more. There's not as much room for more, so that decreases the rate of evaporation. That's why you feel so hot on a humid summer day. That's why your hair takes forever to dry on those days, because the atmosphere is not thirsty for more water. It's already in there, so it slows the rate of evaporation. Number four. What two processes does water vapor come back out of the atmosphere? How does it get back out? Well, condensation, you can form droplets, or sublimation, deposition, when it uh, turns from a vapor back to a solid, like in the case of snowflakes. Lots of words. Number five, in what temperature, at what temperature, pardon me, does water vapor leave the atmosphere? And what's the condition then? Well, it comes out of the air when the air temperature reaches the dew point. If the air is not at the dew point, that means the air is not full and it's not going to leak. But once you're at the dew point, the air is full and it's saturated, so you have a chance of it coming back out again. Number six, what two conditions are required in order for condensation sublimation to occur? The two things you have to have are the air being saturated, which we just discussed with dew point, and you have to have these things called condensation nuclei, little surfaces for water droplets to stick to. If you don't have those surfaces for water droplets to stick to, it's, it just doesn't, it can't come out of the air. It's kind of stuck there. The air will remain saturated. In reality, though, there's always dust, pollen, pollution, smoke, uh, ash from volcanic eruptions. It's always floating around in the atmosphere. So very rarely is there a lack of condensation nuclei on a large scale. Number seven, relationship between transparency, atmospheric transparency, and probability of precipitation. Why is it true? Well, transparency is if, there's, if there was no dust, no aerosols in the air, and the air was perfectly clear, it would be ultimately transparent. That would make it hard for precipitation to happen because there's nothing for the droplets to form on. So as transparency increases, the probability of precipitation decreases because there's nothing for condensation to form on. You have to have condensation nuclei. If it rains long enough, you could wash out, in theory, most of the condensation nuclei in the droplets, and that would make it harder for it to continue. Number eight, why do clouds remain suspended in the atmosphere? Why don't clouds just fall out of the head and squish people and pets and you know crush cars? Okay, it wouldn't happen, but why do clouds stay up? Well, each individual cloud droplet is microscopic. It's absolutely tiny, and clouds form where air is rising. So uh, just like you can hold a piece of paper over an air vent and it'll kind of hover there because of the rising air, if you have a few mile an hour wind going upwards into a cloud as the air rises, microscopic droplets aren't gonna fall through that. They're gonna stay floating and suspended. And what's the temperature where clouds are formed? That would be the dew point temperature. You can always tell where the rising air hits the dew point because that's the level clouds will form at. That's why clouds typically have a flat bottom. Number nine, why does rain, or how does rain form and state the relationship between the rate of precipitation and atmospheric transparency? Well, those tiny little droplets that form a cloud, they're not rain. They're just tiny little droplets that form a cloud. If those droplets sit in the cloud and bounce around the cloud long enough, they're going to bump into each other and stick together. And then little droplets become bigger droplets. And then the bigger droplets run into each other and they become even bigger droplets. And eventually, eventually the droplets get big enough if there's enough condensation happening in the cloud where the rising air can't hold them up anymore. And then down they come. Now, they don't always get big enough. 
Sometimes there's evaporation happening in the cloud just as fast as condensation. And so the droplets never have a chance to get big and fall out. That's why not every cloud gives you precipitation. And the rate of precipitation and atmospheric transparency. When precipitation rate goes up, it causes atmospheric transparency to go up because the water literally washes this stuff out of the air, making it more transparent. Ooh, okay. So there's 5B2. One last one, 5B3. So more key relationships here with temperature and pressure and wind speed and all that. Number one, in what way would the presence of cloud cover affect an area's nighttime temperatures? Well, uh, clouds have the ability to block light from coming in, but at night you weren't getting any sunlight anyways. And they also have the ability to stop heat from leaving back out of the atmosphere because clouds have are obviously water vapor, and water vapor was one of those greenhouse gases. So clouds absorb re-radiated heat, I mean, infrared, hold it near the surface, so nighttime temperatures are warmer than they would be otherwise. What effect would cloud cover have on an area's temperatures if skies remained overcast for several days? All right, now, if you're cloudy all day, that's a little different. Now you're going to block that incoming light. So there's not going to be much to hold in at night anyways. So clouds would reduce the amount of sunlight getting to the Earth's surface, and gradually the temperatures would become cooler and cooler uh, because of the lack of insulation. Number two, what effect would an increase in air pollution have on an area's temperatures? Well, not the greatest question, honestly. Even though I wrote it, it's still not the greatest question. It sort of depends. There's different types of air pollution. Um, we're gonna stick with like aerosols, smoke particulate matter, that type of air pollution. Since the pollutants are going to scatter incoming solar radiation and reduce the amount of energy getting to the Earth's surface, that would act like a man-made cloud and keep the temperatures cooler. Now, if you answered this question and you were thinking about greenhouse gases and that type of pollution, that would make you warmer. So again, sorry about that, probably not the best question I've ever put on paper. Number three, What's the relationship between temperature and air pressure? That was on a, the first worksheet of this topic. As temperature goes up, air pressure goes down. An inverse relationship. Because warm air is less dense, the molecules are more spread out. Number four, the relationship between temperature and air's moisture content. Be careful to state this clearly and precisely. All right, so airs, as air's temperature increases, it is able to hold more water vapor. It doesn't mean it has to have it in there. It could be able to hold it and there's no water around to hold, but it has a greater capacity. Warmer air can hold more water vapor. How does adding moisture to the air affect air pressure and why does it have this effect? Alrighty. As con moisture content goes up, air pressure goes down because if you watched the previous video, uh, water vapor is lighter than other gases in the atmosphere, like oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Water vapor is lighter than all those because it's H2O, and hydrogen is really the lightest element. So if you increase the amount of water vapor in the air and it replaces some of the bigger, heavier molecules, that's going to make the air lighter. So, oddly enough, wet air is lighter than dry air. Number six, how does relative humidity change as temperature increases if everything else stays constant? So if you have first thing in the morning, you have foggy conditions, it's 100% humidity, the air is saturated. Now, if we don't add or subtract any water from the air, we just warm the air up, the humidity is going to drop. The fog is going to burn off as as old people like to put it, it will go away. It doesn't really burn anything, it's water. But it's going to go away because as the air warms, it can now keep the water evaporated so you don't see it floating around anymore. 
and there it goes. So as temperature goes up, humidity goes down. Number seven, relationship between the temperature dew point difference. So the difference between the temperature and the dew point and the probability of precipitation. Again, going back to the previous video, if the temperature and the dew point are the same, your chance of precipitation is very big. However, if the difference gets bigger, they get further apart, that means the air's humidity is going down and the chance of precipitation is decreasing as well. So if temperature and dew point temperature are close, chance of precipitation is high. If they're far apart, like 10 plus degrees, not going to happen, not going to have a big chance. Number eight, what change in temperature would cause the temperature, dew point temperature difference to decrease? So how could you get these two numbers closer together? Well, the temperature is always higher than or possibly equal to the dew point. It can never be lower than the dew point. That's just not legal. That's not allowed. That doesn't happen. So if you want these two numbers to get closer, you're going to have to bring the temperature down to the dew point. So the temperature would have to decrease, drop toward the dew point, and that would increase your chance of precipitation. The back of page three here. Change in dew point would cause the temperature dew point difference to decrease. You could bring the dew point temperature up to the board, toward the temperature. That would happen if, um, well, there we go, what would be indicated by this? That would happen if the air actually had more moisture in it. Specifically for us, usually going across Lake Ontario is going to do that because I don't know if you've noticed, but the lake's kind of wet. 9C, that's going to increase the chance of precipitation. Anytime, any way the temperature and dew point get closer together, increase the chance of precip. Air moving over Lake Ontario absorbs moisture from the lake. How would that affect the dew point? I just mentioned it, but hey, maybe you didn't know. The dew point would increase, which increases your chance of precipitation. Wet air has a higher dew point. Going across the lake is going to make the air wetter, so it's going to increase the dew point. The relationship between pressure gradient and wind speed, as pressure gradient increases, wind speed increases, because wind is caused by differences in air pressure. So the bigger the difference, the bigger the wind. On a weather map, what you're going to look for are isobars close together. That's how you can tell where high winds are. If you've been in class, I will certainly be showing you when we have storm systems going through and hurricanes, how close together the isobars are. Um, it's pretty clear. If the lines are far apart, not windy, lines close, windy. Number 12, general direction of wind motion. Well, winds always blow. Guaranteed, always blow from high pressure to low pressure. It's not possible to go the other way. So winds always go from high pressure to lower pressure. If you blow up a balloon and then let go of it before tying it off, wind comes rushing out of it. It's not going to go rushing into the balloon uh, because it's higher pressure inside, lower pressure outside. Relationship between the level of pollutants and other aerosols in the atmosphere and atmospheric transparency. As pollutants increase, transparency decreases. They clutter up the atmosphere. They make it dirtier. They decrease its clearness, its transparency. Increasing pollutants are going to cause the chance of precipitation to probably go up because they're adding condensation nuclei. Again, there are different types of pollutants, but generally speaking, we're talking more condensation nuclei, so that's going to up your chances. And C, relationship between transparency and probability of precipitation. As the air becomes more transparent, so there's less dust and stuff floating around in it, the probability of precipitation would go down because you lack surfaces for new droplets to form on. So it's going to stop it from precipitating. And finally, the relationship between precipitation rate and atmospheric transparency. One last one. As precipitation rate increases, atmospheric transparency increases. Since precipitation is going to wash the air clean. All right. Thanks for sticking with it. Hopefully that helped a little bit.